I'm kind of with Chris on this time change thing. <laughs> I, for some reason, I thought I was going to gain an hour. And this morning, I was like, 5 o'clock. <laughs> I was a little disappointed. So, I'm glad you can be with us this morning. Um, had a very good time at Fur Point Camp this past weekend. We had 10 people that uh, went. I mean, you think of our little church, 10 people. We, we were supposed to have 12, but Phil and Patty were sick, as you know. Um, but they said they had 50. So we had 10 from our little church, and we came three hours away. So I mean, that's a pretty good, sh pretty good showing. I want to thank those who, who showed up there and, and lent a hand. You know, Bob, Bob was out in the trees. <laughs> he was happy. He saw the trees. He was happy. So it was a good time. I had, we, me, Grace and I had a really good time. And, you know, we, you, get a, you get a be with people, you know, we sat at our table with the people around us and um, getting to know each other better and talking. And, you know, we need to do more of that. You know, I was thinking, you know, last night when I came back, when we got back, I had to come and set up the tables and chairs. And I was thinking, you know, we need, we have a park right here, barbecues. Um, there's uh, those horseshoe things we can play. And, you know, the guys, I was like, almost everyone has, um, things to go off and, sh and shoot. So, I mean, it would be neat to just get together and let's go, you know, do stuff, take the kids fishing. Um, you know, we're gonna do that, uh, that camp out. If it, if it works out, we can do another one in, in August or whenever. I mean, we need to do these things so we can get together and just fellowship and get to know each other better and, you know, just come together. So, I like for us to do that. So, um, as we were learning last week about the triune God, okay, about the triune God, we learned that there is a Father, there is a Son, and there is a Holy Spirit. Yep. And we also talked about that the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Father, but they're all God, right? We also learned that God is sovereign. He controls all because He made all. There's no one that tells him what to do. He is an authority over all creation. Whether you like it or not, doesn't change the fact that he is sovereign over everything in creation. And we learned that God the Father is sovereign, God the Son is sovereign, God the Holy Spirit is sovereign. We also learned that God is holy. He's perfect and pure. And since he is holy, he cannot be near sin. There's no bad in him. He's always does, he always does what's right. And since he's holy, we are called to be imitators of Christ. Believers of the way. To be holy. We've been set aside for his glory. To live our lives as children, which are reflective in our actions and how we're supposed to live. We know that God the Father is holy, God the Son is holy, God the Holy Spirit is holy. Right? As we see, each person of the headship shares the same attributes. Remember, God is holy. There is no sin in Him, meaning that neither is there any sin in the Father, in the Son, or the Holy Spirit. They're perfect. Seeing this in action, let's open our Bibles to the book of Philippians. God is omniscient. Philippians 2, 1 to 11. There's actually a whole lot going on here. Things that have been covered in, in various teachings. It's a good section for you to go and take some time to really go over this on your own. This morning we're looking at a certain purpose, but like I said, there's much more for you to glean off of this, this passage. So let's read Philippians 2, 1 to 11. Therefore, is it, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any reflection or, and affection and compassion, 
Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intended on one purpose. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regarding one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely seek out your own personal interest, but also the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Okay, I'm going to read that again because this is what I want to focus on. Have this attitude in yourself, which is also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God to be a thing to be grasped, but emptying himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which above, is above every name, so that the name Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So when we look at this, what does it tell us about Jesus' attitude towards the Father? You think, but isn't Jesus God? Yes. And see, when we look at this, what do we understand? He humbled himself by becoming obedient. He wasn't working independently. He was working together with the Father. And even though he was equal, he didn't seek equality, but was obedient. You know, in the matter of, in matter of fact, this same confusion is that we've, something we find today in churches, which started in the 1900s here in the United States. And it has to do with the Holy Spirit. Did you know and do you understand that the Holy Spirit does not act independently, meaning on, upon his own initiative, but rather he acts in submission to the Father and to the Son? We can better understand this through the scriptures. Let's go over to the book of John. Let's look at John chapter 16, verses 12 to 15. I put 12 in there because I really like 12 because it says, I have many more things to say, but you cannot bear them now. Right? Do we know everything? Are we told everything? No, we're not. Scripture says it. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what to come. What is to come? He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. See, Jesus foretells the arrival of the Holy Spirit and that the Spirit will not speak on his own initiative then the Lord Jesus tells us that he will glorify me. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, it's going to glorify Jesus Christ. You know, I, believe me, I do understand that this is a, these are, there are topics that we need to eventually uh, cover. This is one of them. And be assured that we're going to get into these things eventually. And see what the scriptures tell us. And how certain things have been, become misunderstood. And we're working towards that. We're taking steps. And remember, we're in a long distance race. Right? And in order to participate in this race, we need preparation. Conditioning. What is it the Apostle Paul tells us when we look at 1 Corinthians? Chapter 9. Let's go over there and take a look. Verses 24 to 27.
says, do you know what those who run in a race all run? Sorry. Do you know that all those who run a race all run, but only one receives a prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in a game of exercises exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as to run without aim. I box in such a way as I do not, as I not beat the air, but I discipline my body and make, my, make it a, my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified. You know, when I've been involved in sports all my life right you need to prepare you need to train you know and, and you need to know when you prepare and train for something it's not just physical right i watch what i ate I, you know back in the day we didn't have youtube i read books right i watched films you prepare mentally you know it's everything you're, you're not just doing one thing it's not just a physical thing you're doing you're preparing all the way around what you eat, how you train, what you look at, and you're looking at um, techniques of other people that, are, that have been ahead of you. We have the Bible. That's what we should be doing. When you pull everything together, it's for one purpose, right? This is exactly what we need to do. We need to seek to live a Christian life. We need to prepare and condition ourselves for a life in Christ. Some, some of those booklet lessons we have out there, people say, well, you know, those things, I, I try going through that, and it's just so, so easy. I already know this stuff. Well, you know, there's nothing wrong with reviewing things. But if you have a poor attitude, what are you going to glean from the study? If you already have it, oh, I already know this stuff. You're not going to get nothing out of it. How many times have you read a verse for the humpteenth time and you're like, wow, I didn't know it said that. Right. But you've read it a thousand times before. But now I clicked. You know, that's, that's what we, we as believers, right, we shouldn't have poor attitudes when we're studying because it's sad. We, we need to be teachable, learnable, able to seek the truth. And you know, to adjust when we see we might have thought something a certain way and say, well, you know what? I thought this said this, but, you know, it really says this. Do you know what I mean? Some people, they, they're stuck on this. This is how I was taught when I was like 10. And this is how it, it, it's supposed to be. But when somebody shows them, this is what it really says. No, but this is what I was taught. You're not being teachable. You need to be able to look at the scripture and say, this is what I was taught. This is what it, it says. So what should I do? Right? We need to be teachable. You know, none of us ever know any, uh, none of us ever know everything. We're always learning. We constantly need to be learning. That's the attitude we should have, the attitude of, a, of, of learners. Because when we don't, and we harden our heart to the things of God that he's teaching us, we go wayward. And some people might think, well, what makes you think you're teaching right? And you know what my answer is to that? I'm not. But you know what? God's word is. If you notice, I try to give you various scriptures when we go when we, on Sundays or when we're teaching on Wednesdays. I go through a lot of scriptures. Scripture should back up scripture. It isn't what I say or what I'm telling you. It's what God's word is telling you. Right? Um... I take what I do very seriously because if I don't, I face dire consequences. And I tell you, that instills fears in me. It instills fear because it's a great responsibility. And to tell you the truth, it's pretty scary when you think about it. So anyhow, we're going through the attributes of God 
And today, what we're going to look at is God is omniscient. So what is... I've got to go back now. <laughs> See, I put that... What is omniscient? It's actually two words, right? Omni is the first part. Omni... Oops. Means all. In science, that's the last part. Science. Science is knowing. So what is God? He is all-knowing. What does God know? He knows everything. Right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this morning. We thank you so much for those that are here. We ask that you guide us and lead us as we go through your word this morning, that you would show us how omniscient you are and how, what that means and how it affects our lives. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the opportunities you provide to us to share your word and to glorify you with our lives. Amen. So God is all-knowing. Have you ever known someone that, was, that knew, thought they knew everything? Right? They believe that they have great knowledge in all things. They think they know more than they do. For example, in the, in the schools, they teach the theory of evolution. First of all, we need to understand it's a theory. In the Webster, I, I mean, and really so hesitant nowadays to go to the Webster, but I do go to the Webster, and I looked up theory. It says it's an idea that is a suggestion or presented as possi possibly true, but that it is not known or proven to be true. An idea or a set of ideas that is intended to explain the fact or an event. So as we, you know, we've grown up in, this, in schools, we, we've seen it all, right? The little monkey into the gorilla and into the man, right? Or the little tadpole that starts growing legs and, you know, we've, we've seen those. All these things that are taught as fact are what? They're just theory. They're suggested or presented as possibly true. But what does God's word, word tells us? In Job 38.4, God speaks to us. And he says, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. How does God know what happened? He was there. None of us were there. None of these science, these evolutionists and these uh, teachers of the evolutionary theory, were they there? No. Now I do believe that God knows everything because he brought everything into being. He was there. He created man. He created everything in the world. He tells us this fact in the Bible. Do you know... Who do you think has the right answers? Is it man that made up this theory, that thinks he knows it, or was it God who was there? One of the things I enjoyed while I was in school is how they can, how they can get a piece of tooth, not even an entire tooth. <laughs> they get a piece of tooth, Right? And they create this in whole entire person, not only that, but the entire environment and society that they lived in, from a piece of tooth. I just don't understand that. I, I just can't wrap my head around that. You know? Carbon dating is another thing. It doesn't make a lick of sense to me. I mean, I don't know much about it, but I do understand the process. Right? And then I think about the numbering. You know, the dating. So, doing computer science and stuff, the computer only knows, right? Any, any computer, even your calculators, can only add. You can't subtract, and can't divide, it only adds ones and zeros. That's all it does. The computer, the only thing it understands, doesn't have a concept of reality of time, right? It only understands what somebody inputs into it. So somebody had to input these computer, these numbers, this data, these, this data for time stamping into the computer. A person did that. 
They say, well, this, is, this, this piece of rock is 10 billion years old. How do you know that? The computer says it. <laughs> well, who told the computer that was 10 billion years old? Somebody inputted it in there. See, then that's the thing that people don't understand. Somebody put the numbers in there. So, see, man thinks and believes that he has great knowledge. But the knowledge he has, or could ever have, is nothing compared to God's knowledge. Don't let anyone fool you. In 1 Corinthians 3, 18-23, it tells us about being deceived. It says, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you think that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish, so that he may, may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God, for it is written, He is the one who catches all the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reason of the wise, that they are useless. So then let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you, whether, the, whether Paul or Apollos or Cyph, uh, Cleophas, or the world or the life or death or things present or the things to come. All things belong to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. God is all-knowing. He is omniscient. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, omniscient, right? Let's jump to first, um, sorry, first, Colossians 2, if you may. Colossians 2, 1 to 9. For I want you to know how the a great struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are in Landosia and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining all wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in the true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom all in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in the body, nevertheless I am with you in the spirit. Rejoice to see you, your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Therefore you have received Christ Jesus as Lord. So walk in him. Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. See that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary, elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him... All the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. See, the Bible is filled with knowledge, with this knowledge. It is this knowledge of God. Right? And you know, in your hands, you have that. The full knowledge of God. We're, we're so blessed to be, be able to have that. Where in the past, they didn't, they didn't have it. And today there's places that don't have it. There's nothing that God doesn't know. Not only that he's, does he know everything you can think of, most importantly, he knows all about you. He knows your name. He knows what you ate this morning or what you didn't eat. He knows what you're going to eat tomorrow. He knows how you're feeling. He knows what you're thinking. There's nothing you can hide from God because God knows everything. God knows about everything. 
It's kind of hard to imagine. The Bible tells us that he knows all the stars by name. Just as he knows when a sparrow will fall from, the, from a tree. You might not want to think about snowflakes, John. <laughs> but it's amazing that they're all different. Think about it. All the snow all over the world. And not two snowflakes are the same. But God knows what each one looks like. How? Because he made them different. Unlike us, there's nothing God has to learn. There's no question God needs to ask. In the Bible, when he asks a question, who is it usually for? Yep, jump to Genesis 3.9. See, he, he asks questions because he wants us to realize something. Here we are at the fall. Genesis 3, 9. What does God say? Then the Lord God called to man and said to him, Where are you? Did God know where he was at? Yes, he did. He didn't have to ask for himself. He's prodding Right? Her response. Now tell me, verse 11. He, and, then he, and, and he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Did God know he ate from the tree? Yes. Did he know who told him that he was naked? Yes. But see, and we do this a lot too with our lives. We make excuses instead of coming to God with the truth. Right? What would have happened when God said in, in, verse, in verse 9, when he called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he would have said, Lord, I'm here and I'm so, I'm so ashamed because I disobeyed you. What would have God done? Forgiven. How about here where he says, who told you you were naked? Did you eat from that tree? I commanded you not to eat. If you would have said, yes, I ate from that tree, Lord. I'm so sorry. And it was Satan, the, the serpent that told me all these things. And I, I listened to his lies. And I know I should have obeyed you. What would have God, done, uh, God have done? Oh, forgiven. But they don't do that. We don't do that. In verse 13, again, then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? Right? And what do we do? Yep. The excuses. The lying. Right? It's not my responsibility. The serpent deceived me and I ate. We do that. We play that blame game. We've been doing it for centuries. But if she would have came to the Lord and said, I, I disobeyed you and I listened to the serpent, he would have, she would have been forgiven. But we continue to play that game. Right? See, these questions weren't asked because he didn't know. He was putting the ball in their court, providing them the opportunity for their benefit. He knows everything. Let's look at something that the Bible tells us that he knows in Proverbs 5.21. You know, I, I think this verse is pretty interesting. It says, For the ways of the man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he watches all his paths. He knows the way and the actions of each and every person. God's not a distant God. Right? He's active in our lives. We're told that he watches. He watches everything. Then let's head to Ezekiel. I'll give you time because I know we're flipping around a lot. Ezekiel 11.5. See, not only does he, does he watch, but we're told something in Ezekiel 11.5. Then, then the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me, and he said to me, says, thus, the, says, thus says the Lord, so you think, 
house of Israel, for I know your thoughts. He not only watches us, he listens. He listens. Knowing this, okay, knowing that he watches everything we do, knowing that he listens to us, right, even our thoughts, how much caution should we use? He knows all our thoughts. Nothing can be hidden from God. He knows all our secrets, the secrets of your heart. You know, you can fool me, you can fool others, but you can never fool God. This fact alone should scare some people. God is omniscient. He knows everything. And we're told in Jeremiah 29, 11, right? Something that God knows, for God knows the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and hope. What could he be talking about? See, God loves you so much. He knows his plans for you. And since God is holy, he has a perfect plan. Hebrews 9.22. His plan included this. Hebrews 9.22. According to the law, no one, no, according to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. See God's plan? He had sent his son into the world, just as we're told in John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world may be saved through him. And we've, in the past, we've spoken about our feelings. And our feelings have nothing to do with what God is doing. In 1 John 3.20, 3, we see what God's telling us. In whatever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. What does that mean? What are, what are our hearts? Our hearts, we're told, they're desperately wicked. Who knows them? Right? But that, it says there that God is greater than our hearts and he knows all things. Then I want you to think about what we see in 2 Timothy 2.19. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord God knows those who are His, and everyone whose name, who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. Remember who you are and who you should reflect in your lives. As you place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and obey Him, there will be a change in your life, a transformation that takes place. And you will find that He will help you even though you have the biggest problems. How? How? Because he knows about it. He will help you live through the, each moment of your life in a way that brings honor and glory to him. That's, that's the purpose, to glorify God. 2 Peter 2.9 It says, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the right, unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Because he knows everything. He knows everything about you. He knows about your sin. You can't hide anything from God. And as we look at these examples of Genesis going back, 
He provides us the opportunity to come to Him. Just as we're told in Romans 10, 13. It says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. See, we serve an omniscient God who is holy and sovereign. Is this something that we truly believe? If it's something that we truly believe, this is something we should reflect upon our lives. We should live it. Not just believe it, but live it. Because if you don't live it, does it mean that you truly believe it? No. We need to truly, truly believe that God says who He says He is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to be in your word, to see, Heavenly Father, that you're an omniscient God, that you know everything. And sometimes we get into our ruts and we think that we know everything, but we know that you know better than we would ever know. And we just ask, Heavenly Father, help us to have confidence in trusting in you in all things. And we just thank you, Heavenly Father, for the people that we have together that can lift us up and, and to encourage us glorify you with our lives. We pray these things in your precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.